All right, well, grab your Bibles if you haven't already got them, uh, bring them to your lap or put them on the table in front of you. And we're back again in the, the book of Habakkuk. And uh, I trust that you're enjoying this series as much as I am. Uh, I'm falling more and more in love with this prophet who is so relevant to our life as we watch him struggling with the troubled times of his day and as we relate that back into our age two and a half thousand years later. So today we're in chapter two. So get your Bibles there and uh, we'll read together. Uh, today I'm reading from the New American uh, uh, Standard Bible Translation. Uh, I'm doing that because in several areas it seems to be preferable to the NIV. So if you are using your NAV, I, I trust that you can follow along, uh, but it's helpful for us to work with the NASB text today. And so I trust that you can make that adjustment as we go. So with your Bibles there, let's begin. And we're reading chapter two and verses one through to four. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I'll keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Behold, at, behold as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him but the righteous will live by his faith. So this is the fourth uh, talk in our series on Habakkuk that we've entitled uh, Living by Faith in Troubled Times. Uh, in chapter one, uh, we had uh, Habakkuk uh, living with a troubled faith. Uh, we have it troubled in verse one through to four because of God's seeming inactivity in the face of injustice and violence within the nation of Judah. And in the face of this intolerable widespread evil, Habakkuk cries out to God in verses 2 to 3 of chapter 1, Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? How long, Lord, must I cry for help? But you do not listen. And it's further troubled in verses 5 through to 11 because God's answer involves judgment coming through conquest by the Babylonians. And that's an answer that Habakkuk could not believe. Um, God had told him, but he still struggled to believe that could be God's answer. But by the time we get to verses 12 through to 17 of chapter 1, the conquest has taken place and the unthinkable has occurred. Uh, but what we find even then is that uh, Habakkuk's faith is further travel, troubled in verses 12 through to 17 because now he perceives a greater evil. A greater evil has taken place. God's cure is far worse, it appears, than the illness so the armies have come, the nation has been conquered, and many of the people have been taken into captivity. And as Habakkuk surveys the carnage around him, he pours out his, his heart to God in a lament. Why, God, he asked, do you tolerate an even greater evil than was there formerly? Why are you silent, God, he says in verse 13 of chapter 1, while the wicked that is, the Babylonians swallow up those more righteous than themselves. That is, the Jews, even in the state of their original injustice. Now, as these uh, events have unfolded in chapter 1, Habakkuk's faith has become more and more troubled. Our prophet has become more and more confused. Now, his confusion was primarily driven by the belief that was shared by, the, by his fellow Jews that God had long ago promised um, that he would make them a great and prosperous nation. Uh, and now Habakkuk, as he looked at the situation around him, asked, how could God fulfill that? How could God make those promises real, given that he allowed, he allowed now for the nation to be virtually exterminated? And for some of us, that's the same tension that many of us will experience in our own lives when we experience suffering or, or injustice. Uh, in those moments, like Habakkuk, we will ask ourselves, uh, where is God? And how can he allow these things to happen? And so like Habakkuk, we will all experience times of deeply troubled faith. And as a, as a, as a planet, as a nation, as nations, we are experiencing one of those deeply troubled times, unprecedented times in many ways. 
So the question that remains is what are we to do in the midst of these circumstances? Uh, how did Habakkuk live in troubled times? Well, we've already learned from Habakkuk last week that the first thing that he did was to engage in a deep and honest lament with God. Uh, and it's something, as we were sharing last week, that maybe we need to learn as Western Christians. Uh, this is not a familiar thing to us, but maybe we need to learn that and to learn it deeply. But second, secondly, we also learned last week that the lament ended in verse 17 with a plea for deliverance. Uh, that Habakkuk expressed as a question to God. He finishes his lament in verse 17 with this statement, is he, that is Babylon, to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy. Now Habakkuk's plea introduces us to the next stage in his journey, in his journey of faith. And we've called that stage waiting faith, awaiting faith. Now, uh, we see this stage and we get this title from chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Uh, in chapter 2 and verse 1, if you've got your Bibles there, you'll see that Habakkuk says, Now, having expressed his plea, now I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I'll keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And then in verse 3, God says with respect to, with respect to his answer, uh, the vision that is to come, though it tarries, he says, wait for it, wait for it. So what these statements do is introduce us to this next stage in Habakkuk's faith. Uh, having experienced deep troubling uh, over many years now and responded with a lament and a plea, he now begins to learn to wait, to wait in faith. So what does that waiting faith actually look like? Well, there are four aspects to Habakkuk's waiting faith that we can discern uh, that we need to learn uh, from him today. Firstly, we'll learn that waiting faith is intentional. Secondly, it's interactive. Thirdly, it's a steadfast thing. And lastly, and potentially confusingly for many of us, it's eschatological. Uh, now, I know that many of us are going to stumble, stumble immediately over that fourth term, but as I worked with the passage, uh, I couldn't find a term that would work better than it. And so uh, when we come to it, I'll just explain it to you as we move into it. So these are our four points, the four points that will make up where we go to in the rest of this time. Uh, so let's begin with the first thing that we learn about waiting faith, and that is that it's intentional. Now, we need to note this. Uh, for Habakkuk, waiting on God was not something that happened accidentally or casually. It was actually a deliberate and an intentional waiting. It was, his waiting was characterised by intention. And we find this in chapter 2 and verse 1, where having offered his plea to God in verse 17 of chapter 1, he says, I will now stand on my guard post and I will station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. So all of these things are statements of intention by Habakkuk. He's being intentional about his waiting. And there are two things we can learn about what it means to be intentional as we watch and as we wait. Firstly, uh, being intentional in waiting means establishing a habit of waiting. It means establishing a habit of waiting. Now... All of the verbs that are used here by Habakkuk in, in verse 1, that is to stand, uh, I will station myself, I will keep watch, all of these things, all of these verbs rather, are imperfects in the Hebrew, uh, and that means they are continuous or repeated actions. So, so this means that Habakkuk was continually standing, was continually stationing himself, was continually keeping watch as he waited and waited for God to answer him. You see, it was a, a habitual waiting. It was a habitual action. Uh, it didn't mean that he watched one night and decided, well, that was a bit tough, I'll have a rest tomorrow. No, it was a day by day, strenuous um, discipline of heart and of mind and of action. Habakkuk was waiting and he was waiting intentionally he was in the habit of waiting. 
Now, until God answers his prayer, you would find then that every day he would make the trek to his watchtower, whatever that represented. Every day you would find him climbing those stairs. Every day you would find him kneeling on the floor and looking out across the countryside and pouring out his heart to God. He was waiting. He was doing that habitually. Now, it's interesting, but we find this idea, this habit uh, of waiting or this habit of prayer as being a pattern uh, in many of the Old Testament saints. I think one of the most obvious and, and striking examples of this is the prophet Daniel. Uh, and Daniel uh, is one of the most outstanding characters in the Old Testament. He, he rises to positions of power, to almost the highest positions of power, in two consecutive world empires. First within the Babylonian Empire, and then when it's overwhelmed by the Medes and Persians, he rises to the top levels of government in that empire as well. Uh, he's an outstanding character. Uh, in fact, if we'd ever had uh, another boy, he would have got the name Daniel because Caroline and I fell in love with this, with this man as we read of uh, the way he lived before God. Now, what you find if you go back to the book of Daniel is in the Daniel chapter 6, we find that Daniel's co-governors uh, in the Medes and Persian kingdom have now set up a trap. Uh, they set up a trap to destroy him because Daniel's ex exceptional qualities as a governor have been noted by the king and he is now about to make him the chief governor in the nation over the whole kingdom uh, and the, the other co-governors become incredibly agitated by this and so they set this trap. And what they do is they persuade the king to sign an edict that says that no one can pray to any other god but the king himself for a period of 30 days. And we're told in verse 10, uh, now when Daniel learned about the decree that had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem and three, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. You see, praying three times a day in this position was Daniel's habit and probably the key to his greatness. So the first thing we learn is that watching uh, involves watching intentionally. It means making a habit of the activity of watching and waiting. And secondly, uh, intentional means establishing a place of waiting. It means establishing a place of waiting. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 2, we're told that Habakkuk, Habakkuk rather, chose a place from which he could watch for God's answer. He says in those verses, as we've already read, I will stand on my guard post. I will, will station myself on the rampart. I will will ascend to the tower or watchtower, depending on your translation. Now, this statement of location was a highly symbolic action by Habakkuk. You see, in most of the ancient cities of Israel, uh, there would have been guard posts uh, from which lookouts would have, would have surveyed the countryside as far as they could see. And the task of these lookouts, or the task of these watchmen, uh, was to watch for approaching danger to the city or to watch for messages bringing statements of information um, to the rulers of the city. And we have an example of that in, chapter, uh, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9 and verse 17 where we are told uh, when, the lookout, when the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman, Joram ordered. Send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? Do you come in peace? So in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1, we have Habakkuk self-consciously adopting this role for himself. He would stand in the watchtower to watch and wait for God's answer to arrive. What was God going to say to this despairing nation in this heartbreak and broken prophet? Now, Habakkuk could have been using the term watchtower uh, to speak symbolically, uh, as in waiting for God's vision to come, but it's more likely that he was actually speaking of a real or a literal watchtower 
Now, it might have been a watchtower on one of the walls of a city, uh, maybe even of Jerusalem. Uh, or it may have been a watchtower that had been assembled in the vineyard or some other location. Uh, we read in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 2 of a, of a vineyard and of a tower, a watchtower that was set up within the vineyard. Irrespective of the exact location, the important point to recognise is that Habakkuk has adopted a special and symbolic place from which he will continually, habitually pray and plead with God for an answer to the circumstances in which he found himself. And it's interesting, but this idea of a habitual place, of a special place to retreat to, to seek God, is a pattern found in many of the great saints of the Bible and of church history. Uh, for Jesus, it appears to have been the Mount of Olives. Um, and it's significant that Luke tells us in chapter 22 uh, that it was this place, it was to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane on the mountain, that Jesus retreated to when he went to pray on the night before his death. And Luke tells us that when he went to that place, it was as was his custom. As was his custom. So this was Jesus' pattern when he was in Jerusalem, obviously. It was to go regularly and habitually to this place. This garden, this mountain, had sacred and significant, a sacred and special significance for Jesus. It was the place that he somehow went to whenever he needed to deeply pray. Now, for Daniel, uh, as we've already noted, uh, it was his upper room. It was an upper room looking towards Jerusalem. You see, the positioning of that is significant. As an exile, he's looking to the place from which he was exiled. And that's symbolic. It's symbolic. But that's understandable too, as he seeks God in his time and age for a return to that nation, uh, to that country. Uh, in terms of um, modern examples, we find Susanna Wesley uh, was said that she put an apron over her head uh, whenever she wanted some time to pray, and she had 10 kids. She was a busy lady. Uh, but as soon as that apron went over her head, that was the signal to the children, it's time to give mum some peace because she's engaged in a sacred activity. For her, the apron coming over her head symbolised her sacred space that she went to to speak to God and to plead with him. For me, uh, for many years before I was married, it was a hill five minutes outside of my hometown from where on a clear night I could look right over the lights of Melbourne, uh, over the, nights of the, the lights of the suburb to the central part of the city. And for several years, uh, my pattern uh, was to go to that place. Uh, there were some deep questions I had to resolve uh, before the Lord. And so night after night, I would drive to that place to talk to him, to seek some understanding, some guidance and some wisdom. Sometimes the conversation would last for an hour, sometimes even less. But sometimes it would be two hours sitting in that car, looking out at that vista before I would have the peace to know that I was right with, enough with the world to take and take me through another day. Um, you're going to laugh at this, but sometimes in the midst of that, I did some crazy things. Uh, on one occasion, on one night, I was so desperate to God to, to hear from him um, that I imagined, rightfully or wrongfully, uh, that I needed to get out of the car. And so I got out of the car and I knelt down on the ground and I took my shoes off. Now, I think if I re re reflect on it now, it was probably I was echoing back to Exodus where in the face of the burning bush, God, Moses is told to take off his shoes. Maybe that's what was happening that particular night. I don't remember for sure. Uh, but I prayed. I got back in the car and I left my shoes beside the side of the road. <laughs> and the next night I came back. Um, it was dark. Pulled up and I started to pray. And in the midst of that, darkness and that prayer I heard a tap on the window and there was a lady standing outside the car. I went down the window and she said to me, did you leave a pair of shoes here yesterday? Um, and I rather embarrassedly said, yes I did. I said I came here to pray and she just looked at me and shook her head and walked back off into the darkness. I think she didn't know what to do with me, this, this strange person that was coming up to this lonely piece of road 
uh, just down the street from her house, night after night after night. Uh, but you see, that was my sacred place. That was my special place. And, and even now, um, when I go back to my hometown, I will take time to go to that mountain and to look and to pray again. You see, it's, it, uh, you can't see Melbourne from it any longer. Um, and it surprised me the first time I did. Like, why, why can't I see Melbourne like I used to? Well, then I realised it's because all the trees have grown up. And you see, those trees now are 30, 40 feet tall. Um, when I started praying there, they weren't even there at all. And they symbolise, in a sense, the years of my life. But uh, that is my special place. That's my sacred place. That's the place where I intentionally set out to hear God. And so the first thing that we learn about waiting faith is that it's intentional. It, 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 it creates a habit, or it should create a habit. And for many of us, it may involve a special place, a sacred place that we go to to meet God. Now, we don't need to do that. But for many saints of history and of the Bible, we find that this was important to them. So the first thing we learn about waiting faith is that it's intentional, it's a habit, and it's sometimes a place to meet God. The second thing we learn about waiting faith is that it's interactive. It's interactive. We need to see this, that the waiting faith for Habakkuk is not a passive thing. It's actually an active or, a, or an interactive thing. In other words, waiting faith as we find it in Habakkuk it's not just a passive sit back and, and let God, but rather it's an active and engaged state. Now, hear me carefully here. There is still a time where we need to be still and know that God is God. That's important. But waiting faith is not perpetually still. Waiting faith is also active and engaged with God in the process as we wait. Now let me show you this in Habakkuk, and I confess my heart was moved a little as I listened carefully to what he was saying in verse 1. And initially I hadn't seen it, but I, as I started to see it, I, I felt its impact on my own heart. And I, I trust you'll see it as well today and feel it as well. Now note what he says uh, in this verse. He says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch. Watch for what? Firstly, to see what he will speak to me. You know that? The first point of interaction is to see what God will speak to me. Now, remember in Habakkuk's day, um, the prophets had a prophetic role, uh, and sometimes they're referred to in the prophetic scriptures as, as the watchmen or the watchwomen of the nation. And we find this depicted in the prophet Isaiah when God calls him to symbolically post a lookout in Isaiah 21 and verses 6 through to 8. And from this lookout, the watchman watched the watch day after day, uh, remaining even at his post, says God, through the night until the message has come. Now, what God is stressing uh, in that portion of Isaiah is that to wait, they were to wait. Isaiah was to be like a watchman waiting for his word and then revealing it to the people. Now, this is one of the roles of waiting faith. It is to wait until God has spoken, until his word has been given. Waiting faith sometimes involves staying in those quiet places until he has communicated with us. Now, let me say this. so essential in the modern church where we have so many people often running around claiming that God has said this or God has said that, God has communicated this or communicated that. And in many times, it's just simply that what they're communicating is their inflated imagination of what God has said, not necessarily what he has, what he has actually said. You see, some, God doesn't speak loudly. He often speaks in the quiet places, and sometimes it's only in the quiet places after long, agonised hours of prayer that we'll even hear a small sentence from him. It will come but it's found in the quiet places. So waiting faith is, is interactive in the sense of waiting to hear from God. But second, it's interactive in a different sense, and I want you to see this. Uh, if we 
observe verse 1 again, we see that Habakkuk was not merely waiting to hear from God, but note the, the, the expression that he uses, but, but he's waiting for how I may reply when I am reproved. How I may reply when I am reproved. So the second point of interaction is to consider how may I reply when I'm reproved. This is what Habakkuk tells us. Now, my breath was taken away a little bit when I started to understand Habakkuk here. This, this statement suggests that his expectation was that God would rebuke him for the boldness of his lament. And that what he's actually doing as he waits is that he's gathering himself to make a response to God when that happens. You see, Habakkuk had dared to question the earlier revelation of God when he asked the Lord how, when he asked God how it could be that God would tolerate the destruction of the nation through the hands of the ruthless Babylonians. Now, as he looks for God's response to his further complaint, he could hardly anticipate anything other than a rebuke for himself again. And so he prepares himself for additional disputation with God. Now, on the surface of it, it seems strange. But in preparing himself to dialogue with God in this sense, Habakkuk actually is following a recognised procedure in Israel where the wise sought wisdom from God. Uh, go back and look at the book of Job. In Job, we find Job longing, we're told, to dispute his case with God. Or in the words of chapter 23 and verse 4, Job says, I long to lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. You see, as um, Palmer Robertson is saying, by this bold manner of entering into this dispute with God, the wise of Israel hope to receive divine clarification of their perplexities. You see, Habakkuk wasn't arguing with God to prove him wrong. That, that's impossible. He was arguing with God to gain divine understanding. And it was in this process of interaction, or it was in this dialogue backwards and forwards, in this interactive process that is seeking wisdom for the moment. So the second aspect of waiting faith is that it's interactive. It engages with God. It reasons with Him. It argues with Him, seeking understanding and increased wisdom. So that's our second aspect of waiting faith. It's interactive. The third aspect is that it's steadfast. It's steadfast. See, waiting faith clings to God steadfastly. It refuses to give up until it's received an answer from him or gained a sense of his presence. Uh, and we find the urging for steadfastness in faith uh, is God's urging, actually, uh, for Habakkuk in verses 2 through to 3. In verse 2, he answers, God answers his prayer and then tells him, record the vision and inscribe it. And then in verse 3, he tells him to wait, to wait for the vision. Uh, though the vision tarries, verse 3, wait for it, for it will certainly come. You see, what God is doing is urging Habakkuk to steadfastness in waiting. And interestingly, uh, we find this same verse and this same idea picked up by the, by the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 10 of Hebrews. Uh, and quoting this verse, he urges his listeners to persevere and to not give up their confidence in the face of persecution and suffering. Uh, he's saying, stay steadfast in your faith. And that, quoting Habakkuk, is what it means to live by faith, to stay steadfast. Uh, one of the most inspirational stories I've heard of steadfastness is of a story about George Mueller that we actually shared in our church war room uh, last year. And for those of you that uh, read that story, you'll remember this. And for those of you that haven't, enjoy it with us as I share it with you now. Uh, well, George Mueller kept multiple journals throughout his life. 
And it was that which created such a powerful witness for him in the end. Uh, and in November 1844, he records in his journal that he began praying every day without admission for the conversion of five individuals. And he tells us in his journal, it didn't matter whether he was sick or in good health, every day he prayed for these five people. And 18 months later, 18 months after he started praying, the first person was converted. Five years after that, the second was. And then six years after that, the third. So within 11 years of starting to pray for these five, three have been converted, but the other two remain unconverted. Six, uh, 36, rather, 36 years after he made that initial entry in his journal, when he started praying for these five every day, he noted in his journal that these two still remained unconverted, but he wrote, and I quote, but I hope in God, I pray on and look for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. But they will be. In 18, uh, 1897, 52 years after he began to pray for these five, those two men were converted. They were finally converted. But it was after Buell had died. God answered his prayer, but it wasn't something he got to experience. And see, this is one of the marks of waiting faith. It, it's steadfast. It endures. It persists. It never gives up. It continues to hope in God, even when years have passed or circumstances suggest that there is no point in hoping, no point in praying any longer. Waiting faith is steadfast. It's steadfast. And lastly, uh, it's eschatological. Um, and some of you might even be struggling to get your name, uh, to get the name uh, off your lips, you know, eschatological. Uh, and initially I was very reluctant to use it, but in the end I couldn't find a better substitute. Uh, it's the only word that could really convey or carry the ideas that are present in this particular element. Now, eschatological refers to events that will take place uh, in the end times. It's a technical word that theologians use that, that, in a sense, captures everything that God is going to do as he wraps up the world at the end of time, as he brings together all the final matters of history and ushers us into the next period of existence. So it captures, the, it captures death, the death of the saints. It captures the idea of judgment at the end of time. It captures the final state of humanity. All of these things are caught up in this term eschatology or eschatological. So by waiting faith being eschatological, I mean that it takes into consideration all the mysteries of life and of time as we know it. You see, God's specific instructions to Habakkuk in verse 2 was inscribe the vision and make it plain on the tablets. Now what God is doing there is underscoring for Habakkuk that the vision that he's giving doesn't merely apply to himself, but it's going to apply to all the generations that follow him. You see, inscribing it on tablets is a, is a, is a clear and deliberate allusion to the original Ten Commandments that were given to Moses, and they were given on stone tablets as well. So what God is saying to Habakkuk is that this vision, this vision that I'm about to give you, is for the long distant future. It's not merely the answer to your individual circumstances. No, it's an answer to the long-term future of the world. And it's something that you need to put on tablets for future generations to hear and to understand. Now, one of the greatest challenges we have as individuals is in understanding events in relationship to the long term. Uh, we so often want God to answer our prayers in our time frames. We, we struggle, understandably, uh, to think in terms of anything broader than our lifetime. That's understandable, but it's not a problem for God. And actually it illustrates the mystery that's sometimes involved in, in our prayers and sometimes in our suffering. As we pray, we struggle to think beyond our circumstances. That God 
can and does. And he has to weigh up the answers to our prayers that take into consideration eternity and all the events that are to flow beyond maybe our lifetimes. Now, that doesn't mean that God is not urgent about answering our prayers or bringing things to conclusion. It's quite fascinating that the word hastens here with respect to the vision in verse 3 it is literally um, to yearn or to pant. And so it's not merely that the vision hastens toward the goal, but actually the vision itself um, yearns or pants for its fulfillment. The prophecy itself longs to fulfill itself. It longs to hasten to that goal. Now, it's because uh, that echoes God. God longs for that as well. But he has to weigh into that multiple factors as he brings all things to a conclusion. And that's why sometimes there's a mystery associated with his answers to our prayers. So waiting faith is eschatological. You see, it allows room for mystery. It allows room for the fact that sometimes things may take place in our world that we don't understand. It allows for the fact that sometimes things don't take place in our lifetime like we long for or plead for them to occur. You see, this was the case for Habakkuk. Living in his time and place, he couldn't understand why God would allow the Babylonian invasion. But in verse 3 now, as he's moving on, God says to him, the vision I'm about to give you is yet for the appointed time. You won't fully understand it, Habakkuk. The healing events that you long for will come, but probably not in your lifetime. And it's the same for us. So while we are intentional about waiting, while we interact and we plead and we argue with God in our lifetime for a resolution to our issues and our problems, while we remain steadfast and faithful over that lifetime as we pray, we also need to recognise that we wait eschatologically. See, to wait eschatologically means that we humbly recognise that there are some things about God's working that we simply cannot understand. There are some things that must take place beyond our lifetimes because that is their appointed time. But in the meantime, we wait in faith. We wait in faith, for that is part of what it means to live by faith in the midst of troubled times. Let me conclude with a brief story from Nick Rivkin's book, The Insanity of God. And I know that some of you have read this book, and so you'll know this story as I share it with you. But it was such a powerful story uh, that I think illustrates this so, so helpfully. So let me just share it with you as I conclude. Now, in his book, Rifkin shares the, the story of Dmitri, uh, a Russian Christian who was in prison for 17 years for his faith. As a result of his um, starting a Bible study that just kept on growing in his home, Dmitri was, uh, was um, moved a thousand kilometres away from his family uh, to a prison where he was physically tortured and locked away in a tiny cell that was so small that it was just literally one step from his bed to the door. And in this place, he was the only Christian amongst 15,000, or 1,500 rather, other hardened criminals. And after he arrived there, every morning at daybreak, and for the next 17 years, when he was in prison, Dimitri would awake in the morning and stand at attention by his bed. And as was his custom, as was his habit, he would face the east, raise his arms in praise to God, and then he would sing a heart song to Jesus. And the reaction of the other prisoners was, was predictable. All down the row of cells as he opened, as he raised his voice in these early hours, they would react with laughter and with cursing and with jeers. And that went on year after year. And the guards tried repeatedly to make him stop this practice. At one point in time, they actually got him to, or they, they tried to persuade him to sign a confession uh, 
that he would forsake Jesus. And they told him that he might as well do that because his wife had been murdered and his children had been made wards of the state. Um, and so desperate to be released in order to care for them, he agreed to sign that confessional paper or that confession document. But overnight, in the wisdom of God, um, sensing through the Spirit that he was in desperate circumstances, his little family, a thousand kilometres away, gathered in a circle and started praying for him. And miraculously, uh, the Holy Spirit allowed Dimitri to actually hear the voices of his family as they prayed. And in the morning, when the guards came with their confession statement, he said to them, I'm not signing it. In the, in the night, God, let me hear the voices of my wife and my children and my brother praying for me. You lied to me. My wife is alive. My children are with her. I'm not signing anything. Uh, towards the end of his imprisonment, he was threatened with execution because he had pasted verses of scripture uh, in his cell. Wherever he could get a little scrap of paper, he would treasure it and he would write in the tiniest print possible a verse of scripture that he could remember. And then he would post it in different locations in his cell. And on this particular occasion, the guards had discovered it and uh, he was appointed for execution. And as he was being dragged down the corridor in the centre of the prison, the strangest thing happened. 1,500 hardened criminals stood at attention beside their bed, faced east, and began to sing Dimitri's heart song. And the reaction of the guards was overwhelming. They, they released him immediately and said, Who are you? Who are you? Well, shortly afterwards, Dimitri was released. But I, I tell you that story because do you see some of the parallels to Habakkuk's waiting of faith? Well, like Habakkuk, Dimitri's waiting was eschatological. He was living with a reality that, uh, that his life was involved in suffering and there was no, no, no assurance that it would actually not end that way. But like Habakkuk, he found his own sacred and habitual space, his bed facing east, his song and his scripture. And that became his habitual practice. It was intentional in his waiting. And like Habakkuk, God gave him moments of interaction when he heard his family praying. God opened the windows in a miraculous way to let him hear, to reassure him in that moment. And like Habakkuk, he remained steadfast, steadfast for 17 years. And he was alive to see the fall of communist Russia. Habakkuk was denied that opportunity with Babylon. He wasn't to see the fall of Babylon. He had to wait with the awareness that the vision of God was yet for the future. It was still coming. But you see, their waiting faith was the same. It was the same. And so the lessons of Habakkuk's faith reach across to us now, more than 2,500 years, years later, and they teach us today. They teach us how to wait in faith. Shall we pray? Our Father, we, we thank you for these prophets of old. We thank you for these amazing saints who have suffered so much and who teach us so much. And Father, in the midst of our troubled times, we ask that you would teach us these lessons, help us to take these things deeply into our hearts and to learn from them and to be transformed as a result. Father, help us to learn these practices. Help us to learn the features and the aspects of waiting faith and to incorporate, incorporate them deeply into our lives in order that we may wait in perplexing circumstances in a way that honours you and brings joy and delight to your heart as you observe us. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God.